So today's video is going to be part two of the Cliddock murders case. If you didn't catch part one, I think you need to watch that one before you watch this one, otherwise you won't understand it. So I'll leave it up here in the eye. You can just click that, watch that one, and then come back right here. Of course, I will give you a little bit of a summary on this case before we get into it. But before we do, I just want to thank our sponsors for this video, NordVPN. I've used NordVPN for years now. We're coming up on years to protect my information when I'm working online. A VPN acts as a barrier between you and all your information and people that might be trying to hack you or access that information. And it works by making it appear as though you are somewhere else in the world by giving you a different IP address to operate from. And this gives you a whole bunch of benefits like watching content on YouTube that might be blocked in your country or, you know, other countries, Netflix or Disney Plus. I always recommend using a VPN if you work from public Wi-Fi a lot, you know, like cafe Wi-Fi and libraries and stuff like that because you never know how secure those networks are. And now the cybersecurity experts over at Nord have launched what is called the Nord Pass, a free and simple password manager that allows you to share your password with trusted people. So say like your friend wants to borrow your Netflix account and you send them your password through Nord Pass. It also helps you to generate super secure passwords and stores them all on your Nord account so you'll never forget them. And you have access to any of these passwords on any device. So that's your phone, your laptop, your mum's laptop, you know, whatever. And as always, NordVPN have a treat for my subscribers. Subscribers, if you want to get 68% off of your subscription, making it just $3.71 a month plus an extra month free, then you can go through my link, which is nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use code Eleanor at checkout. Thank you so much again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into it. So for a little bit of a summary before we just jump into part two of the case, the Cliddock murders happened in South Wales Cliddock in South Wales in 1999. The victims of the Cliddock murders were a family of four, three generations, all wiped out in one senseless massacre. The family was made up of Mandy Power, a 34 year old nurse, mother to Emily and Katie Power, both just eight and 10 years old respectively, and their grandmother, Doris Dawson, who was almost 80 years old. All murdered in the middle of the night in their own home. They were all bludgeoned to death with a pole and Mandy was sexually assaulted. The killer then lit four fires in the home in an attempt to burn as much evidence as they possibly could to evade conviction. And it worked for the most part because it took over a year and a half to get an arrest. They finally arrested a man named David Morris or Di Morris who had been having an affair with Mandy at the time of her death and he was actually convicted because his gold chain was left in the power home. Although many people believe David Morris to be innocent because the South Wales police have a track record of convicting innocent people just because they're rushing to get a conviction, they just want to hold someone responsible, even if they know in their heart that that person is innocent. And in this part of the case, in part two, we're gonna look at the many, many reasons why people believe David Morris is innocent and did not commit these murders. And we're also gonna look at some other potential suspects that look an awful lot more suspicious than David Morris and perhaps the reasons why they weren't looked into as suspects. So the first piece of evidence that sticks out like a sore thumb to me is the conversation that David Morris was overheard having at the pub on the night of Mandy's murder. So like I said, David and his friends and his girlfriend were all in the pub. David gets into an argument with his girlfriend about Mandy Power because he'd been cheating on his girlfriend with Mandy and I think she knew. The girlfriend storms out of the pub and David Morris stays in the pub. He's getting angrier and angrier as time's going on and then he leaves at 11.30 and tells his friends that he's gonna go to Mandy's house and have sex with her, Mandy Power. Well, the only way that the police know that this conversation took place was because it was overheard in the pub by a South Wales police officer. This police officer remembered a conversation that he'd overheard in a pub randomly one night, a year and a half ago, and then inputted it perfectly into the records. And it just so happened to be evidence against someone that they were looking into anyway. How would that officer have remembered that conversation so well 
that he just randomly overheard in a pub. He didn't even know Mandy. He didn't even know David Morris. So he didn't know who they were talking about. So it can't have really stuck in his mind that well. And this isn't the first instance of South Wales police fabricating overheard conversations to fit their case, to fit their suspect that they're looking into. You know, things like this just happen really conveniently for the South Wales police. In the case of the Cardiff News Agent 3, so this is a different Cardiff 3 than the one that we spoke about at the end of the last video. These three were teenagers that had been accused of murdering a man in a news agent. However, they were completely innocent. They were later found innocent and wrongly convicted. But as they were being suspected, police arrested all three of them and put them in holding cells and at one point, as a police officer was walking past these holding cells, he overheard a conversation that was very incriminating. They were practically confessing. They were just telling each other, like, maybe we should just confess. Supposedly, they were shouting that between the cells to each other. Over a decade later, after they'd been put in prison, they were finally found innocent of this murder that they were accused of. And this conversation that this policeman overheard was found to be all lies. So it wasn't the first time the South Wales police had fabricated fake overheard conversations to incriminate people. But there were also plenty of incidences in this case, in the Clidic murders relating to David Morris. But for this case specifically, there were also a lot of promising leads that came up in the investigation that linked to other suspects, not David Morris, that police conveniently ignored and didn't look into and didn't push. Why was that? Was it because they thought they were gonna convict someone that they maybe didn't want to convict? For example, around midday on the day of the murders, so the murders happened and were discovered in the morning, before lunchtime on that day, a woman named Nicola approached the police and said that she thought she'd seen something suspicious the night before. Nicola was driving home in Cliddock near Kelvin Road around 2 a.m. on the morning of the murder, so around the time of the murder, and she saw a man walking along the pavement. Now, because Cliddock is quite a tight-knit community, I don't wanna say everyone knew everyone, but there was a good chance you would know someone if they were walking along the road, you know? So Nicola, being the kind person she was, she kind of pulled up to the side of the road to see if she knew this man to offer him a lift home, and she rolled her window down. This man looked straight at her in the car. She realised she didn't know him, and so she rolled the window back up and drove away. But because she pulled in at the side of the road, wound the window down, this man looked right at her, she got a good look at him, so she could give a very detailed description of this man. She said that he was a tall, white man, maybe around six foot, in his 30s or 40s. He was stocky, he had white hair, he was wearing jeans. He was carrying a bag and he was wearing a black, shiny bomber jacket that she likened to the type of jacket that police officers wear. Police offered for Nicola to meet with a sketch artist to produce an e-fit sketch of this man's face. She went, they created this sketch, and she looked at it and said that it was 90% accurate. So there was a lot going on this sketch. This could help them find the killer. Police also asked Nicola if she wanted to go around some shops with them to kind of look at the men's jackets, see if she could find anything that looked relatively like this jacket that she'd seen this man wearing. They also told her to have a look through any clothing catalogues that she might have at home and look through the men's jacket section, see if she could find anything like it. But she said that these kind of jackets hadn't been around or in fashion for a long, long time. And the only people she'd really seen wearing them in previous years were the police. So anyway, this sketch had finally been made. They had this good description of this man, what he was wearing, where he was, you know, this could help them catch a killer. But for some reason, this police sketch was never released. It was never put on the news. It was never on Crime Watch. It was never in the newspapers. In any other murder case, unsolved murder case of this severity especially, this police sketch would be all over the news. It would be everywhere. It would be all you could see when you turn the page in the newspaper. So why wasn't it? So anyway, that's just a couple of suspicious things to start off this video. Now let's look at our first potential suspect that is not David Morris. Mandy Power's best friend from rugby, Alison Lewis. Alison Lewis had actually been at 9 Kelvin Road on the morning that the bodies were discovered and she actually helped 
firefighters, paramedics and everyone identify all of the bodies. She seemed very distraught that morning as I'm guessing anyone would be if they just found out that their best friend and her whole family had just been murdered in such a terrible way. But as police began speaking with her and questioning her, they found that Alison's sorrow stemmed from a much deeper place than just losing a best friend. It turned out that Mandy Power and Alison Lewis had been having an affair for quite a while. Mandy Power was single and free to do so, but Alison Lewis had a husband and a whole family and children. They'd been seeing each other for quite some time behind Alison's husband's back. Alison often telling him that she was gonna go stay at Mandy Power's home because Mandy was having a tough time, she was caring for her elderly mother. Alison very much acted as though she was just being a very good friend to Mandy, but of course the two of them were in the relationship the whole time. The two of them originally met at the rugby club, but they never really became close until one particular night, Mandy Power was hosting a tarot night at her house. Like I said, she was really struggling to make friends due to her kind of life situation. She had to care for her children, she had to care for her mother. So she realized the only way she could make friends is if she invited them to her. So she held this tarot night at her home and she told all of her friends to bring their friends and then hopefully she could make friends through mutual friends. And Alison was one of those mutual friends and she'd never really been that interested in Mandy before. I don't think she really knew Mandy and the times that she had seen her, she'd been in like a rugby kit with a hair up, no makeup on, you know, but now, she was seeing Mandy Power all made up. She had makeup on, she had nice clothes on. She looked really beautiful and Alison fell for her straight away that night. Alison Lewis had always known that she liked girls to a degree. One of her first ever crushes was on a female teacher when she was younger. However, this was something that she'd always suppressed. She'd just kind of gone for men all her life and she'd been married for a very long time so I suppose she hadn't had to think about it for a while but when she saw Mandy Power all of these feelings just came to the surface and she wanted to be with Mandy but she didn't think she would have much of a chance she thought that Mandy was fully straight and she'd never be interested in Alison however at one point during this tarot night Alison overheard Mandy telling one of their friends that she really liked Alison and she thought that Alison was good looking too. From that point on, Alison made a move and the two of them had been seeing each other ever since. They were practically inseparable. The whole world thought that they were just best friends, but they were more than that. And Alison Lewis was just inconsolable when she found out about Mandy's murder. She was sobbing, she was wailing, she was collapsing, throwing herself about. When she went home that day, she began hallucinating that she was speaking to Mandy. She was holding her hands out. Her friends eventually had to give her some kind of medication to kind of calm her down and level her out. But later that day, she began telling her friends and her husband that she didn't want to live without Mandy. She didn't want to go on without her and she wanted to go and join her. And that was when Alison ran upstairs to her second story bedroom and tried to jump out of the window. Her friends all had to hold her back. She eventually calmed down that night, but she struggled with this for a very long time. And you'll see that a little bit more later on. Of course, being Mandy's girlfriend, Alison was a very high up person of interest in this investigation. There was gonna have to be a lot of interviews and questioning and stuff. And Alison was very cooperative. She was very honest about their relationship, even though it was a secret and she didn't want her husband to find out, but the police felt differently about that. See, Alison's husband, he was named Stephen Lewis and he was also a police officer, not in the same department that was investigating this murder. He actually worked seven miles away in a place called Neath. But everyone in the police force pretty much knew each other and he actually had an identical twin brother named Stuart Lewis who worked in this police force on this case. Officers on this investigation basically said to Alison, look, either you tell your husband about this affair or we're gonna tell your husband about this affair because they said that they thought that this was vital to the investigation that everyone knew the truth. I don't know if there was some bias there or I don't know if that is genuine police protocol that they have to kind of tell all these secrets to everyone involved to be able to get fair questionings and stuff. Either way, Alison Lewis reluctantly told her husband about this affair that she'd been having with Mandy Power for a very long time 
And he said that he was going to divorce her at the earliest opportunity that he got. Anyway, now police knew of the women's relationships. Like I said, Alison Lewis was at the top of the list of people of interest. Perhaps there'd been an argument and Alison was angry at Mandy and maybe she'd done this or maybe she was worried that the affair was going to get out. Maybe Mandy had said that she was going to tell Alison's husband. And so maybe Alison killed the family to silence them. I don't know. There's so many different possibilities for a motive here. And police also learnt that Alison Lewis was one of the last people to see the family alive. The night before the murders, the Lewis household had been having a barbecue and it was actually Stephen Lewis that invited Mandy over to the house because that was his wife's best friend. And so Mandy came over, she came to this barbecue, she stayed the night and then the next morning after Stephen Lewis left for work, Mandy and Alison got into the same bed. And after police mentioned this affair to some of Mandy's friends, they received a very interesting third party perspective of what this relationship was like. Mandy's friends said that she was very naive, she was very easygoing, she let people walk all over her sometimes. She took a lot of stick from people that gave it to her unfairly. And Alison was very, dominant, she was very possessive, sometimes quite controlling. And it just so happened that Alison and Mandy had a huge falling out not long before the murders. And they'd actually temporarily split up for a while over this falling out when Alison found out that Mandy Power had been lying for quite some time about having cervical cancer. Mandy had told everyone in her life that she was going to all these different consultations and tests and treatments and she would get them to give her lifts to the hospital and back and she would tell them all this fake information that just wasn't true. She didn't have cancer. And as soon as Alison Lewis found out about that, she was, she felt angry, she felt upset, she felt lied to, she felt betrayed. This was the woman that she had serious feelings for. And she'd been lying to her this whole time for, for what? I, d I don't wanna speak ill of the dead, so I don't wanna say that she had, you know, really malicious motives, but for, for what reason? I think a lot of people would split up with their significant other if they found out that they would, they were lying about something so serious. However, after a while of being split up, Alison Lewis realized that she was more upset without Mandy than she would be if she'd stayed with Mandy and she just had to come to terms with the fact that she'd been lying to her. She was miserable without Mandy, to put it bluntly. And so she went crawling back and she asked Mandy to take her back. Mandy happily took her back because she also really liked Alison and the two of them were back together. Mandy's friends also told police that they believed that Alison might have a key to nine Kelvin Road, which she actually denied and there's never been any evidence. There was no key found in her house or anything. Of course, she might have gotten rid of it. And some of the friends also told police that Alison had a particular dislike for Mandy's oldest daughter, Katie, 10 year old Katie. I don't wanna say that with confidence though because I don't know how true that is and stuff like that is also very subjective. I suppose it depends what friends had seen what, you know? It depends on each friend's personal experience of seeing Alison with Katie and it depends how they'd taken certain conversations or how they'd acted. I don't know if that's 100% true, so. Take that with a pinch of salt. So police decided that they wanted to speak with Alison Lewis again because all of this was looking a little bit suspicious. And so just as they were going to call her in for another questioning, Alison got checked into hospital. Like I said before, Alison's mental health following the murders was in absolute turmoil. She was struggling so badly. She was suicidal. And so she actually voluntarily checked herself into a psychiatric ward for two weeks to be put on constant suicide watch because she didn't trust herself to stay alive following this. And due to this, police couldn't question Alison Lewis because her doctors, her psychiatrists said that she wasn't in a mentally stable enough state to talk about the murders properly. Police officers actually stood guard outside of her hospital room the whole time she was in there for obvious reasons, she was a high up person of interest, she could easily just flee. And I think they do have police officers on wards like that. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they do have police on site for 
obvious reasons. But Alison actually refused to leave her hospital room when the police were there. Even when there was a fire drill going on at the hospital, she refused to leave her room because the police being out there was just too overwhelming for her. So police couldn't question Alison, they couldn't get a statement from her, and they just felt like this was all very convenient. You know, she'd been so dramatic on the morning of the murders. She'd been at the scene. She was one of the first people at the scene when she didn't actually live close to Kelvin Road, so... How was she one of the first people on the scene? And now she was in a psychiatric ward, unable to be questioned for however long, you know? It was all very convenient. It was suspicious, but it wasn't necessarily grounds to make an arrest. There was no solid evidence that Alison had done anything to Mandy. There was just motive and some very odd goings on. So anyway, Alison Lewis finally gets released from hospital and police are finally able to question her again. And police specifically wanted to know about the morning of the murders and how it came to be that Alison was one of the first people at the house able to identify the bodies. She told police that the first she'd heard of this house fire on Kelvin Road was around 6 a.m. that morning. She received a call from a friend that knew about Alison and Mandy being best friends and she told Alison that this was going on. This was around an hour and a half after the fires had been discovered. And so Alison gets in contact with her husband, Stephen Lewis, who was actually on his way to work at that point at the police station. He agrees to turn around, not go to work, turn around, come and pick Alison up and take her to Nine Kelvin Road to go and see her best friend and see what was going on. And this was around 8 a.m. that they arrive at the murder scene. But Alison's version of events didn't quite line up with eyewitness testimony. A lot of the neighbours said that the timings were off. Mandy's neighbours said that they noticed Alison to be one of the first people at the scene of the murders, just as the bodies were being recovered from the fire around 6am, which is when Alison said that she was just waking up. They also noticed that she looked freshly showered and she smelled very clean for someone that had just jumped straight out of bed and got straight there, you know? Alison didn't have a very solid alibi for the night of the murders. As to be expected, most people in the early hours of the morning would just be asleep, which isn't a solid alibi. That can't be confirmed or checked or, you know, there's, there's no way to say they were definitely in bed asleep. Her husband, Stephen Lewis, the police officer, also said that he was asleep, so... There's no confirming either of those. The suspicion was mounting against Alison Lewis, but you know, South Wales police and their corruption, nothing was done about it. They weren't official suspects, they weren't properly looked into. But Alison Lewis wasn't the only suspect in this theory. Her husband, Stephen Lewis, and his twin brother, the other police officer, Stuart Lewis, are also involved. A friend of Mandy Powers told police that they'd been speaking with Mandy in the days before her murder, and Mandy had confided in them that Alison Lewis's husband, Stephen Lewis, had threatened Mandy to stay away from his wife or he would kill her. And this was confirmed by a second account. One of Mandy's neighbors told police that she'd seen Stephen Lewis shouting at Mandy in her house. So Stephen, was stood on like some steps outside Mandy's home. Mandy was in the doorway, crouched down, covering her head like she was defending herself. Her daughters, Katie and Emily, were sat on the stairs crying next to her. And Stephen Lewis said, you go near my wife again and I'll kill you. And Stephen Lewis actually admitted in his questioning that this neighbor's account was true. He had threatened Mandy's life. But up until the morning of the murders, Stephen Lewis supposedly hadn't known about this affair because police forced Alison to tell her husband about the affair. So why would he be threatening Mandy a few days before the murder to stay away from his wife or he'd kill her? He had no reason to do that if he supposedly didn't know about the affair. Anyway, this gives him a motive for the murders. This makes Stephen Lewis look so suspicious Maybe he was just acting on those threats that he told Mandy. And in retrospect, the police sketch made by Nicola, you know, that witness that saw the man at 2 a.m. and she pulled in to potentially offer him a lift. She realized she didn't know him, so she drove away. She made a police sketch with an official police artist and that sketch was never released to the public. Well, that sketch really did look like Stephen Lewis or potentially his 
identical twin brother, Stuart Lewis. It looked like both of them and perhaps that was the reason it was never released to the public because they knew it looked like them and they knew it would lead to investigation into them, perhaps. On top of that, if you remember what Nicola said about what this man was wearing, she said that he was wearing a shiny black bomber jacket and she likened it to the ones that police wore. She said that they didn't really sell them in shops anymore. They weren't really in trend anymore. And the only people she ever really saw wearing them were police officers. One of them, Stephen Lewis, had the motive. He wanted to get rid of his wife's affair, his wife's girlfriend. And Stuart Lewis, his identical twin brother, had the power to help him get away with murder. He was in charge of this whole investigation. And Stuart Lewis, the, the identical twin brother, also didn't have an alibi for the night of the murders, but his is exceptionally more suspicious than the other two. He was actually on police duty at the time. He was on the night shift and he was supposed to just be patrolling the area of Cliddock and, you know, the surrounding areas, just in his car, seeing if anything needed help. I don't know, you know how police just go patrolling in their cars to, you know, keep the area safe or whatever. However, he went completely off radar for three hours between midnight and 3 a.m. And that is the exact window of time when the Clidic murders would have happened. Stuart Lewis swore that he hadn't been into Clidic on the night of the murders. He hadn't been patrolling that area. He'd been patrolling elsewhere. But witness testimony says otherwise. A taxi driver had come forward to police to say that he'd seen on the night of the murder on Kelvin Road, a man sitting in a red Persia on the side of the road. And I'll give you one guess as to what car and colour car Stuart Lewis drove, a red Persia. And now that this realisation was made, this case had to go elsewhere. It had to go to, a, to an outside police force to investigate this police force because it was looking very suspicious. And it was found that Stuart Lewis hadn't handled this case very well right from the start, right from the moment he found out that this was a murder he hadn't been following protocol. So because this was just a house fire, or it seemed to be just a house fire, they only had one police officer at the scene and that was Stuart Lewis. But as soon as the paramedics realized that these victims weren't victims of a house fire, they were victims of foul play, of a murder, Stuart Lewis was supposed to go back to the police station, report this to everyone in the police station and write it on the records. But he did neither of those. He just went back to the police station and continued his work and just didn't say anything. He didn't even seal off the area as a crime scene, which, you know, is one of the first things that he should have done. It was just little things like that. I suppose you could argue that it was a slip of the memory, he completely forgot, but everything all at once? It seemed as though he was doing little things to hinder the investigation, you know? If the area wasn't sealed off as a crime scene, people would just keep walking through it and that would contaminate any evidence there. It was also found, now that this kind of second party police force came in to investigate this police force, it was found that other police forces in the South Wales area had actually been urged to look into the Clidic police force as potential suspects or for potential corruption, but none of them had because they're all as corrupt as each other. All of this, plus the pressure from the public to make a new arrest because most people that look into this case believe that David Morris is innocent of these murders and people wanted a new arrest. They wanted the real killer to be found. So all of this pressure led to police finally arresting Alison Lewis and Stephen Lewis on suspicion of murder. Not only that, Stuart Lewis was also arrested on suspicion of trying to interfere with a murder inquiry. And once they were all arrested, the evidence just kept piling up against these three. Stuart Lewis was actually released pretty quickly from police custody, but he was suspended from the police force until a disciplinary investigation could happen to determine whether he was fit to be a police officer, you know? And during this investigation, as they were kind of looking into Stuart Lewis, they confronted him with the police sketch and they said, look, this looks like you. This looks like you, it looks like your twin brother, Stephen. And he still tried to deny it and say, no, it looks like David Morris. I think it looks like David Morris. 
But he later changed his opinion on that. When I saw that photo of it, um, basically, I, it, it, I remember looking at it and, and thinking, Jesus Christ, look at that, right? The, the, the thing is, there's people have been on the team who, are, who have worked with, who have, who people have stayed in the house, people have gone socially with. And when I saw that, I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, that's an amazing photo of it. And the question you should be asking is, why wasn't anything done about that? I mean, when I saw it, I was amazed. Well, that we're, the we're asking those questions well, as well, believe me. We're asking well. those questions and, and, as well. Why, why weren't you put on an identity proof? Well, was it, it within seven days? Yes. Okay. Oh, well, but the point is, the point is, if that existed yeah. the, the week after the murders, yeah. right, even Stephen would say it, the two of us should be in Yeah, yeah. We should have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in that clip, you even see Stuart Lewis himself say that his own team did a bad job on this case and that they should have been brought in for questioning and they should have been investigated due to their connections to the family, due to their likeness to the police sketch, but they weren't. Something else that should have happened, but conveniently didn't, was that the Lewis brothers didn't get their DNA taken and tested against the scene. I mean, there really wasn't that much evidence, DNA evidence at the scene because it was all so badly burnt. However, there were very small samples like on Mandy's body and different things like that that could have been tested, but they weren't. And oddly enough, David Morris also wasn't tested against those DNA samples. And you would think that if police were so sure that David Morris was the killer and they were receiving this much suspicion, people saying you've convicted the wrong person, then they would test him against the DNA to get that slam dunk piece of evidence to say, no, we've got the right person. But they didn't. Were they worried that if they did test David Morris's DNA against the crime scene DNA, that it wouldn't be a match? Is that why they didn't do it? So while Alison and Stephen Lewis were both in custody, Stephen Lewis was finally put into a police lineup for Nicola to come and have a look. Nicola, the woman that saw the man in the middle of the night on the morning of the murders, she'd got such a good look at this man that she should have been shown a police lineup a long, long time ago, but now this was over a year and a half after she'd seen that man. But despite the length of time, as soon as Nicola saw this police lineup and she saw Stephen Lewis, she picked him out as the man that she'd seen that night. He was the man that she'd seen walking by Kelvin Road on the night that Mandy and her whole family were murdered. And Nicola also mentioned to police that David Morris, as soon as she saw who they'd actually convicted of these murders and she saw David Morris's face, she told police that that man didn't look a thing like the man that she'd seen on the night of the murders, which is very interesting. She was so sure that it was Stephen Lewis that she'd seen and she said David Morris, she'd never seen David Morris before. Now, one thing I didn't mention before because it didn't seem too suspicious at first, but now it seems very suspicious, was that Alison Lewis's DNA was tested against a little bit of DNA found at the scene. Now, this is very confusing for me to explain. Not every DNA sample found in the home was tested, but there was one DNA sample on Mandy's thigh that was, and this was a match to Alison Lewis. Now, it kind of made sense at the time because they were a couple and, you know, they'd been together on the morning of the murders, so maybe they'd done stuff and and the DNA ended up on Mandy's thigh. But would Mandy not have showered since then, you know? It's been debated whether this piece of evidence actually means anything because Mandy just might not have showered since she you know, saw Alison Lewis that morning. But people think that maybe Mandy did shower that morning and then this DNA evidence got on her thigh when she was murdered and sexually assaulted. Because the thing is, this DNA sample on Mandy's thigh was from an epithelial cell from Alison Lewis's vaginal fluid. So it's a very specific type. People think that the DNA could have just been left over from the sex toy that was used to assault Mandy Power. I don't know, it's completely up to you whether you think that is evidence or not. I thought it was worth mentioning, but some people regard it as evidence. Some people say, well, you know, they were seeing each other, they saw each other on the morning of the murders. It makes sense why it would be there. But all of this evidence altogether paints a potential theory. Maybe Stephen Lewis 
found out that Alison, his wife, and Mandy Power had sex on the morning of Mandy's murder and that was the final straw for him and later that night he went to her house and killed her and her whole family. And maybe then he got in contact with his brother who worked at the police station and would have been working on that case and said, can you cover this up for me? And the brother accepted. So this is the theory that a lot of the public believe and also the theory that David Morris's lawyers have used to try to get him out of prison, to try to appeal his sentence. His lawyers have argued that this case should have been thrown out right from the beginning due to the misconduct from the police officers. The amount of things that Stuart Lewis himself did wrong seemingly on purpose is astounding but even during this part of the case even after they'd been called out and accused of so many things police were still doing things that they shouldn't do you know questionable things for example the first time that david morris met with his lawyer so this was a year and a half into the investigation he was in police custody and he was given a lawyer but of course he had to meet with the lawyer in the police station he couldn't be let out so police gave him a specific room in the police station and they said look there's no cameras well there is cameras and there's audio equipment but none of it will be switched on this will be a completely confidential meeting between you and your lawyer to talk about your case. But of course, with a police force this corrupt, it was never gonna be confidential. The recording equipment that was supposedly switched off at the time of this meeting was accidentally switched on right in the middle by an officer that actually worked on this murder investigation. He said that he was just doing a routine technical check of all of the microphones, all of the cameras. He just wanted to check that they were all working and he accidentally switched on the one that was in David Morris's meeting room. And when he accidentally switched on this camera and this recording equipment, he overheard something very incriminating. David Morris, according to this police officer, told his lawyer that he'd been to Mandy Power's home on the night of the murders, slept with her, and then set off walking home at around 4 a.m. And if that was true, that meant that he'd been there while the murders were happening. But the supposed evidence of this officer overhearing that exact conversation is a little bit off. So when the officer heard this conversation, he noted it down and he noted down the exact time that he heard it, which was 1.39 p.m. But the 39 on the note looked as though it had been changed, you know? It didn't look as though it said 39 to begin with. And after this note was given to a handwriting analyst, they said that they believe that that number had been later modified. So it had originally been written as either 129 or 120 and was later modified to say 39 due to the difference in the ink color and the ink thickness. They could just tell that some of it was written later than other bits. And this is very important because David Morris's conversation with his lawyer, this meeting only began at 1.34. So if the officer had originally written 1.29 or 1.20, it couldn't have been right. And maybe the officer realized that. Maybe he looked at the time that he'd written down from when he'd heard this conversation and realized that it didn't quite line up. And so he later went back and changed the time. However, even the changed time still doesn't quite line up. The officer admitted that he had gone back and changed the time because he realized that he'd innocently just written the wrong time. You know, he'd written a two instead of a three. He meant to write a three the whole time. But even at 1.39, that was only five minutes into this meeting and the first 15, 20, sometimes even 30 minutes of these meetings with a lawyer is all taken up by legal stuff. You know, he's just kind of, the lawyer's just explaining to David Morris how this is gonna go, what they're gonna do. You know, he's just explaining the process. David Morris wouldn't have been talking about the murders and his version of events by that point. The lawyer actually said in court that he and David Morris didn't start talking about the actual version of events until after 2 p.m. So 1.39 couldn't have been right. But despite the times not lining up and the fact that it was impossible that the officer could have overheard such a thing, this evidence was still used in court against David Morris. Now in this court hearing of David Morris, there was also a mention of Stephen Lewis, Alison's husband, and a bunch of other minor suspects that they'd looked into, you know, Mandy's ex 
boyfriends and you know anyone else that could be of interest and all of their pictures David Morris's Stephen Lewis's all these other men their pictures were compared to this police sketch that Nicola had made but it wasn't until after that trial that people noticed that the picture used of Stephen Lewis to compare to this police sketch seemed altered it seemed edited to not look like Stephen Lewis. His face seemingly had been slimmed. The picture had been narrowed that way. So his head looked longer, it looked thinner, and it no longer looked like the police sketch. Even though the original sketch and the original picture of Stephen Lewis look incredibly similar. Here's a visual of the picture that was shown in court, the slimmer one, and the original picture which was actually taken the night before the murder at the barbecue. Of course, because the police would never admit to purposefully editing a photo that's gonna be shown in court, we don't know whether it was done purposefully or not, but I mean, I'll let you decide what you think. Eventually, Alison, Stephen and Stuart Lewis were all released from police custody and not one of them faced a single charge. And David Morris is still in prison to this day for these murders, 19 years on. So many people in Wales, not everyone, but so many people believe that David Morris is innocent and someone else is guilty for these murders. There's been protests, there's been petitions trying to get David out of prison and get the real killer in prison. Even spanning all the way to the beginning of this year, pre-pandemic, at the start of 2020, people were protesting to get David Morris out of prison. And like I say, these murders happened almost two decades ago now. There's been graffiti popping up all over Wales for almost two decades that says free die Morris. He has a lot of public support. I've obviously given a lot of evidence in this video to say that the police are suspicious and David Morris is innocent. However, there is of course the flip side. I don't wanna be biased in these videos. There are a lot of reasons why people do suspect that David Morris is the killer. He has said and done a lot of suspicious things. I don't want you to take this video as me supporting or defending any one party. I don't know if it's quite come across that way. I kind of hope it hasn't, but at the same time, when I do these kind of videos, it's hard for me to keep my emotions to myself. I get very passionate about these. I tried to stay as impartial as I possibly can, but I'm now gonna give the flip side of this and give you all the reasons why people think David Morris is guilty. That men's chain that was found in Mandy Power's home was David Morris's, but he lied to police at the start and denied that it was his. He even went so far as to buy a new chain, break the clasp on it intentionally, put another, you know, makeshift clasp in there like the other one had, put a little bit of paint on it and say, no, this one's mine, look, I've got mine at home. I mean, obviously police aren't gonna believe that. There's not gonna be two identical men's chains with broken clasps and a makeshift clasp dipped in paint in the same village in Cliddock. I mean, it just wasn't believable. He later admitted to police that the chain found at Mandy Power's home was his. And the reason he hadn't admitted to it in the first place was because he was scared, because he knew how corrupt the police were. And of course, according to him, it was there for an innocent reason. He was having an affair with Mandy. He left it there by accident. And he feared that if he said, yeah, that's my chain, then that would incriminate him enough for this corrupt police force to say, well, okay, well, he's definitely the killer. If his story is true and he was just having an affair with Mandy and he's completely innocent, I understand why he would lie. I don't ever want to condone lying to authorities because that's, don't do that, don't do that. But when you know your police force is corrupt and they have falsely convicted and imprisoned 19 people for murder convictions. I can understand, I can. You would be terrified of being falsely jailed, especially when you know that there's something that suspicious in the murder scene, you know? On top of that, there's also David Morris's criminal history. He had a past of being a very violent, very aggressive man. There was domestic violence. He had the reputation in the town as not being very nice to his partners, his ex-wife, his current girlfriend, and Mandy was now his 
you know, another love interest of his. Maybe this had just gone so far one night when he was, he was drunk, he was on drugs. And also his alibi was a little bit questionable. I mean, he said he set off walking to his mother's house, which was like, eight miles away from the pub. Why would you walk eight miles at half past 11 at night? And then it started raining. So he went back home to his own house and got home in the early hours of the morning. That would conveniently explain why he got home in the early hours of the morning if his girlfriend was to notice that was when he was home, you know? The fact that he was unaccounted for in those hours is rather suspicious. So, you know, there are some odd things when it comes to David Morris. There are some suspicious things, but I would also say that the sketchy things that the police did somewhat outweighs the odd things that David Morris said or did. I don't know, it's up to you which you think outweighs the other. Do you think David Morris did more suspicious stuff or the police did more suspicious stuff? And with a track record like the one that the South Wales police have in terms of corruption, I'll let you make up your mind. Please do fill the comments with all of your opinions. I'm so interested to see what the comments are like on this video. David Morris's charges were actually quashed at one point in this investigation on the basis that there'd been some corruption, but not with the police, with his legal representative. The lawyer that was representing David Morris was actually found out to be the same lawyer that was representing Stephen Lewis at the start of the investigation, which probably shouldn't have been allowed for very obvious reasons. Of course, legal representatives by law can't be biased or swayed in any particular case based on previous connections or personal beliefs, but it's believed that that could have possibly happened. Maybe this person represented Stephen Lewis, had personal connections to him, had personal beliefs that he was innocent, and so that affected how they represented David Morris. A retrial was done and David Morris was once again given life in prison. It didn't work. He's recently tried to appeal his case and the appeal was denied. Again, it didn't work. And because David Morris still to this day maintains his innocence, he said that he had nothing to do with these murders. That means that he doesn't get the same privileges that a lot of other inmates in prison get. He doesn't get access to the gym or certain classes or clubs. He just has to work. He has to be, you know, a cleaner in the prison. He has to, he doesn't get the same treatment as some of the other prisoners get. All because he wants to get out one day. If he was to say that he was guilty just to get access to the gym or certain clubs or classes, that means he's never getting out of prison. But he maintains his innocence so much that he's willing to give all of that up to hopefully get out one day and see his family again. But that is all I have on this case. Like I said, please, please, please let me know what you think of it in the comments down below. This has been such a roller coaster to research for me. It was so interesting. So thank you to everyone that requested this case, especially my channel members. They've been asking for this one for a while. I hope I did this case justice. I hope this is what you expected <laughs> when you asked me to cover this case. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you wanna get 68% off of your subscription, making it just $3.71 a month, plus an extra month free, you can go through my link, which is nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use code Eleanor at checkout. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a big thumbs up down below because that really helps me out. If you wanna subscribe, there'll be a circle right here if you want to subscribe to my second channel there'll be a circle right here and if you want to watch another video from me there's a playlist on the screen right now bye